breath. So here, and Dr. Miletus, if you want to introduce yourself, brief intro, and um, uh, take it away. Well, certainly. Well, welcome everybody. I'm a naturopathic physician for the last 30 years here in Oregon, where I serve as primary care. Got my lovely little DEA number, still got that, and prescribe as needed. Um, so there's always a blend of how we approach medicine. So one of my favorite sayings, and much of what I'm going to share with you, we all can talk very high level. We're going to talk about some very high level stuff today and the pontine tegmentum and some other little conversations like that. But ultimately, we have to translate everything we learn into something our patients can appreciate. Hence, my play on the word restoration. In order for us to restore our bodies, we have to have good sleep good sleep hygiene. Um, and I'll share a little tidbit. When I was 38 years old, I was a buck 85. That's many bucks ago. And I had sleep apnea, obstructive. And as we know, 10% can be also central. But mine was obstructive. I had orthodontic work and I was a mouth breather throughout my childhood with allergies. And so that changes facial structure, arch of your mouth and all those lovelies. So I was desaturating down to 65% oxygen. And one of the odd things is I was the dean at the Naturopathic University at the time, and many of us know about periphery artery disease relative to the shiny shin syndrome, which I learned the other day from a colleague of ours in Texas, you can also get from wearing cowboy boots. Lo and behold, so if you're in Texas or yes, I'm wearing cowboy boots, there might be shiny shins from the wear and tear of the cowboy boots. But I lost all the hair on my legs, TMI especially as on the first slide. Um, but lo and behold, 65% oxygenation at night, not so good. So obviously this topic of sleep, sleep apnea, sleep wake cycle is near and dear to me. And now basically 20 years later, I'm still thinking, well, I wonder if I had been taking nitric oxide, then would I have been able to mitigate some of the challenges? So um, I've been very fortunate to write over a couple hundred national articles, including on PubMed. Um, I wrote about plasmalogen and Alzheimer's and dementia most recently, a couple of years ago now on PubMed. I write, write a lot, I lecture a lot. I was the dean at the Naturopathic University for seven years here in Oregon. But my kind of my area of pride is I started 16 clinics for the poor and underserved during that period of time. I still do work through my practice called Divine Medicine. So enough about me. Um, let's talk about something that is very noble, a molecule that has got the Nobel Prize. And so, you know, 1998, all the hoopla, and even prior to that, there was a lot of top of nitric oxide, but it was actually the president of the American Heart Association that says the most important discovery of the century, to think that our body all the way along, we talk about carbon dioxide, we talk about all these other things, but well, well what about this lovely little gas nitric oxide, which we all know about? And so if you've had talks already about nitric oxide, we know it diminishes as we get older and half-life about three to five seconds. We know that there is a continuous need for building blocks, substrates. And one of my big lecture series I give is about NAD and the mitochondria, mitochondrial function and CD38, sirtuins and PARPs, a whole nother conversation for another day. But I like to look as a provider of the last 30 years and a person that's gotten paid to learn and so forth as, well, what does our body have that diminish with, with age? Well, for many people, flexibility, but while we lose our nitric oxide production capacity to a large degree, we lose our NAD capacity to a large degree, and we also lose our ATP production. And when we were about 30 years old, we made about 60 kilograms of ATP per day, 24 hours. And now we're not making as much ATP. In fact, we lose about 10% of our ATP production per decade. So I'm 57, so I'm 27% behind the curve of where I was when I was 30. And without ATP, of course, we're not gonna fuel our body. Without nitric oxide, we're not gonna perfuse our body as well. So we can start seeing a little bit of a potentially common theme slope here of endogenous molecules that we might want to consider. We also know that thanks to the advent of genetics in the last 10, 15 years in my clinical practice, 
Methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, one of the things which we all talk about these days. Well, if you have that polymorphism and you're not mitigating it with folate and particularly MTHF or metafolin or something, potentially it's going to impact your nitric oxide levels. And so we'll chat a little bit about that today as well. And of course, epigenetics and you know the whole concept of genetics, lose a gun, diet and lifestyle, pull the trigger. But once again, what are our risk factors relative to our epigenetic side of things? And one of the lectures I gave in New York ooh, about a decade ago, I was for an integrated health symposia. And I flew in that night from the West Coast. I live in Oregon. And I said, I could tell you many things about you know, genetics. I was talking about epigenetics at the time. But I'm going to tell you, I'm tired. And I says, but I kind of think here, and I was speaking extemporary, I was like, how many cells in my body must be tired be before I perceive tired? Some of you are tired. It's been a long day. Maybe complex cases and patients, and you're kind of wishing it was almost Friday already. And so I asked the question, I don't know how many cells in my body must be tired. Can any of you tell me of the trillions of cells in my body, what's the aggregate, the summation, the big sigma on how many cells have to be tired before I perceive tired? I said, I did wake up early to do my hair. I had a similar hairdo back then. So that's my humor at 7 a.m. as a keynote speaker. And, but I, and nobody had an answer. And I, even afterwards, I said, feel free to tell me how many cells have to be tired before I perceive tired. Then I was on a roll. I said, well, how many cells in my finger have to be um, injured before I feel pain? And I says, and before we answer that question, have why is it that a large splinter sometimes hurts less than a paper cut or a small uh, splinter. So once again, so much we don't know. And so that's how I started the talk a decade ago. And I still don't know the answers to either of those questions of how many cells. So with that said, moving on to nitric oxide, we of course know that a healthy salivary oral cavity is important. And people that use Listerine or other very strong mouthwashes might have decreased ability to make nitric oxide in the oral cavity and start that process through the microbiome. So after all, our GI tract starts in the mouth. And so, of, of course, the claim to fame that we've all heard about for well over a decade now is beets, beets, beets. But the problem with beets is they have oxalates in them. So an alternate, alternative approach would be to use something like arugula, which has zero milligrams of oxalates. So we know about 9 to 11% of the population will get kidney stones, particularly the calcium oxalate stones. So why would we give a clinical therapeutic that might increase the total burden of the straw in the camel's back. So of course, nitrites can go into the GI tract and we, of course we can make our nitric oxide. Lots of references and I have these articles if you'd like to have them along the way, feel free at the end to reach out to Jack and I'll send your articles if something captures your imagination or attention. And one of the sayings that we all know is desore, which in Latin means doctor, and whether we're a doctor, or a PA, an NP, or whatever, we're all educators, and sometimes a picture is worth a thousand, word, a thousand words. So if we were to just relegate nitric oxide to just vasodilatory effect, that'd be pretty cool. We have a larger garden hose, as I share with my patients. So if I have a small one-fourth inch garden hose, I won't need a nozzle at the end. There's going to be lots of pressure at the um, tail end of that garden hose. Now, if it's a fire engine hose, I bet I'm going to need a nozzle off a normal outlet um, water spigot in order to have a good flow. So if that's all we were talking about today is vasodilatory effect, that'd be compelling. But we also the know that nitric oxide, and this is the Journal of Nephrology 2014, reduces oxidation of LDL cholesterol, make it a little stickier, a little less gooey, um, reduces platelet stickiness reduces monocyte stickiness, um, reduces multiplication of smooth muscle, great for arterial wall issues. And so like, hmm, nitric oxide, tip of the iceberg. It's also applied to mental health and other things for other talks for other days. So I wish this res was better from the peer review literature, but it shows the extracellular regulation of nitric oxide. But the tidbits that I wanted to point out because I love the mitochondria, and the mitochondrion, each little mitochondria, is nitric oxide helps with mitochondrial biogenesis, telomerase activity. And so even though we're going to be talking about sleep and sleep hygiene today, it's like, well, but don't we need to have the energy at the mitochondrial level and have enough mitochondria to function? 
Well, we got the EC proliferation onwards. And so it's like, okay, I'm, I'm interested. I'm compelled when I see literature like this, like, okay, well, nitric oxide is working and we know currently what it's doing, but what will we know five years from now? And when I lectured as part of an NIH grant with the local MD medical school um, in Oregon, Oregon Health Science University, I was lecturing to the fourth year students and pumping them up. It was spring, they're ready to graduate, go into residencies, do the rotations. And I says, you folks know a lot. In fact, five years from now, the th or five, five years ago, the people that sat in these chairs didn't have the therapeutics. They didn't have the diagnostics. There's been a lot of advances in medicine in the last five years. But I said, remember five years from now, that's how they're gonna feel about you unless you're a perpetual learner and you folks clearly are perpetual learners. And so when it comes to that factoid, it's like, wow, what will we know about nitric oxide and its other therapeutic benefits? Here's a typical graph we've all seen with nitric oxide. You know, question mark, maybe one of you know. Well, why do women not drop as quickly on nitric oxide as men? And so that's kind of a, a question mark. Is it once we hit the menopause? Is it iron load? Is it, I mean, there's probably lots of reasons, but it's interesting. And we see the endothelial dysfunction. And I add to this slide the concept of glycocalyx, which many of you are very familiar with. But when I graduated in 1992, and I parroted this for years to my patients, your blood vessels are like a nonstick pan. As long as you don't put a scratch in your nonstick pan, the endothelia is fine, and you're, it's going to diminish your risk for heart disease. I did that 90, 91, 92, all the way through to the mid-2000s. And now we know it's au contraire, mon frere, but what about the glycocalyx? So now we have this fur-lined, not literally fur as we all know, but as I share with my patients, it's no longer just a smooth interior blood vessels. We've got this aspect in the shear of blood flow going along, actually inducing nitric oxide production at the endothelia. So it's like, wow. So now you just, we used to have that nice little smooth blood vessel that we were all trained on. It's like, no, nah, well, under electron microscope. Now, this is really how it looks. It's like, Okay, humble. back to why I shared the story about presenting to the fourth year graduating MD students or any degree students. It's like, hey, what we learned a few years ago, let's, it's, it's probably changing. So we know that tryptophan in our diet or supplementally is very helpful to support lots of different things. Serotonin, of course, melatonin. Earlier today, I was doing a consult with a colleague of mine and they had a patient taking tryptophan, not 5-HTP, but tryptophan proper. And their kinaurinate levels and quinolate levels were excessively high, pointing towards neuroinflammation. And they had a sleep hygiene issue by chance today. Or my first consult of the day was a person doing organic acid profile tests. And that tryptophan they were supplementing with was going catabolically towards neuroinflammation, quinolate and kinaurinate. And also they were elevated on 5 hydroxyindole acetate there was not a melatonin data set there, but it's like, wow. So kind of interesting. We know the sleep-wake cycle of wear your amber glasses at night, have your phone on the a night mode, all these aspects. But the question is, this is happening no matter what. This is our melatonin levels with the aging process. And we all might remember being teenagers, adolescents, and all of a sudden we're challenging our parents. I don't want to go to bed. I want to stay up. And then, of course, when we we're young adults, we basically started noticing that it might be a little harder to sleep and, of course, the aging process. During the um, past two and a half, three years of that virus that was going around, which I won't speak of, there was actually a piece of peer review literature I could send to you about melatonin and its anti-inflammatory, anti-cytokine benefits. Very compelling. So why am I talking about melatonin? We're talking about nitric oxide. Well, don't we need nitric oxide to basically perfuse our pineal gland? Yes. Um, don't we know nitric oxide levels drop with the aging process, much like melatonin? Yes. Do we know that there's nasal sprays out there, which I happen to have one out of Israel, which has nitric oxide in it, which has some antiviral properties, they claim. So it's like, hmm, it all ties together. Melatonin levels are dropping. Our hormones are dropping, our NAD levels are dropping, our ATP levels are dropping. 
and our perfusions dropping. So our beautiful, well-orchestrated little dance of the sleep-wake cycle is askew. And somehow along the way, before all the internet and high-speed communications, everybody woke up with the rise of the sun. They went to bed because there's no light, A. And B, they had a sleep-wake cycle. And then we've altered it with modern technology and that passing of the baton between melatonin levels dropping, cortisol levels spiking, but now melatonin is anti-inflammatory per the peer review literature and dampens a lot of the cytokines. Well, of course, when we have patients and we do a salivary cortisol, whether we do a serum cortisol, if, if we can get them in a native state and not after commuting to the local draw station, or we do a 24-hour cortisol, what happens when our cortisol levels drop as we get older and we get more worn out and that term adrenal fatigue or adrenal burnout, not Addison's not on the other extreme high levels, cortisol or Cushing's, but what happens if a normal physiological level of cortisol is about 20 milligrams per day for a healthy person, whatever healthy is these days. But now let's say I'm making 12 milligrams of hydrocortisone, which of course crosses over to cortisone, cortisol. And now will I have breakthrough inflammation? And if my sleep-wake cycle's off, will I have that breakthrough inflammation throughout the night because melatonin's not there? also to quench me while I rest and restore. So hopefully I'm going to share some philosophical thoughts that I ponder all the time while I'm not sleeping at night. So we've got our pineal gland. And once again, we only relegate nitric oxide to vasodilatory effect. And here's the vasculature to the pineal gland from a 2013 peer-reviewed journal article. So it has to have the building blocks of tryptophan and other nutrients for the pineal gland as a glandular tissue to be healthy, structural integrity, let alone ex endocrine production of melatonin. So it has to stay healthy so it can keep on doing what it needs to do. It needs blood supply. We know that we do carotid studies. We know that, of course, arthrosclerosis occurs. They even found that in Vietnam when they did autopsies on the young people that passed away um, in combat. And there was vascular changes occurring even in 18-year-olds. So are we watering our garden, including our pineal gland? And if that was the, the end-all be-all of our nitric oxide conversation and sleep, that would be interesting, but it's not. So nitric oxide, of course, has a lot of other therapeutic benefits. I can also individually, through Jackie Goodling, which the, her information will be at the end of this presentation, you can have a copies of all these slides. You're welcome to use them with patient education if you find it would be edifying for them. So nitric oxide, of course, a claim to fame on late night commercials right here on penile erection and also for female pelvic congestion. But it's been used for preterm labor. It's been used for cardiovascular disease, neurological issues, learning and cognitive challenges, also potentially post-stroke, depending on whether it's vascular or whether it was hemorrhagic. So you look at all these considerations, lots of literature right now on cancer and nitric oxide. And as any good peer reviewed article will say at the very end, further studies need to be done. But it's like, okay, nitric oxide. So here's the normal physiology on the left hand side, right hand side, pathophysiological aspects where we have coronary perfusion issues. I just did a calcium score on a patient of mine, 81 years old, um, remarkable. I diagnosed her with Cushing's 20 years ago, almost to the day. And she was a Navy military um, officer, which she broke the proverbial glass ceiling way back in the day. And But they just called her hysteronic. Now, you don't have any problems. You have low blood sugar. You have high blood sugar. You have. I ended up diagnosing her and then again confirmed by the local medical school, hey, you have a pituitary adenoma going on. And they actually offered her the deal of the century. They scooped out her pituitary gland. So she is literally pan pit. And I get to help manage her pan pitness with her, the vasopressin, the hydrocortisone, stress dosing, you get the idea. And, but what's interesting is that perfusion that's going on here is so critical for the regulation of the mitochondria and the endothelial production. And the reason I share the 81 year old story with you, the calcium score, she had a zero, a zero, a two, and 189 for the widow maker of of the vascular supply to the heart, the left descending, um, descending vascular or 
ventricular artery. And so it's like, and I got to break that news to her yesterday. We're all traveling back from seeing my sister, a little sleep deprived here with an inflammatory breast cancer, which is what my sister's dealing with. And so it's like, wow, coronary perfusion. So I have her on the things that support her glycocalyx, the 81 year old. I have her on nitric oxide support, but she works out 30 minutes a day, takes her heart rate up to 110. She actually did a stress test, no, no ST changes. And at the same time, her echo was fine as well. So, but just kind of interesting, but what are we doing? We're supporting her nitric oxide. We're supporting her mitochondria. We're supporting the cardiomyocytes to do what they're needing to do. And of course, making sure we've got nitric oxide. So from a pathophysiological side, we start seeing what happens to our nitric oxide levels. What causes them to drop? Diabetes, metabolic syndrome, excess cholesterol, inflammation, hypertension, smoking, which that patient, which was the Navy officer, 81-year-old female, has 38 pack years on her, um, no longer, but previous to me knowing her. Um, and so we're starting to see like hmm, nitric oxide levels. And so now all of a sudden, not only do we have the aging aspect of things, we have the aspect of we're getting older, we're having these disease comorbidities going on and or some dumb luck genetically. And it's like, okay, well, all of a sudden we're looking at who might be a good candidate in our clinical practices. And I have a specific slide for diabetes alone, but hey, what about the CRP? Or what about the interleukin-6? What about? And I remember one of my patients, an Intel executive, I run a concierge practice. I also run a practice for the disadvantaged. Um, and she would always come in and she says, Chris, why is my SED rate? And why is my CRP fine? Chris, can you not see it's red, swollen, her thinner compartment? And she has RA, rheumatoid arthritis. She says, it hurts. And you're saying my inflammation levels aren't there. It wasn't until we looked at interleukin-6 that we actually caught where on her cytokine panel, her body was doing the talk. CRP was fine, SED rate was fine, everything else was fine except for her interleukin-6. So once again, inflammation for her and nitric oxide unique unto her because we all get to our states of wellness or brokenness on different paths. So you're probably very familiar with nitric oxide test strips. The more pink, the more robust you're supposed to be per the study. And what's interesting is the bacteria use nitrate and nitrite to fuel the electron transport receptors in our respiratory chain. So this is what I like to know about is I want my mitochondria to do what my mitochondria do. As I'm sitting here, 20% of my oxygen should be going to my brain, 20% of my glucose should be going and being utilized by my brain. But once again, it takes energy, energy, energy to do all of these things, replete my neurotransmitters, have my heart continue to go tick tock, tick tock along the way. So once again, a happy, healthy oral microbiome is absolutely critical for optimal levels of nitric oxide production, and particularly if we're eating our veggies to support that and hopefully low oxalate foods. So then we go to the methylene tetrahydrofolate issue. So I'm 677 homozygous, and as a result, lucky me, I, got, I was born with a neurotube defect. When I had my first MRI done about a decade ago, I've got the ventricles of an 80-year-old, major dilation, but I've always had a very large head, very small face, and I've been walking around in normal pressure of hydrocephalus for a very long time. Welcome to the world of a 677 homozygous MTHF. But relative to our conversation, if you have an MTHF polymorphism, not only do you have increased risk for homocysteine issues and dysregulation, but it also alters our ability to make nitric oxide. So do I take a nitric oxide supplement on a daily basis? Yes. Would I do it even if I didn't have a polymorphism? Yes. But once again, you need to have the MTHF. So looking for a formula that has MTHF built into it for our patients, which are basically suffering from pill exhaustion more often than not, is important to catch one and get it done. So facts that we love to hear even as providers is we got about 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Heart beats about 100,000 times a day. In fact, if you do the math, 72 beats per minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours to a day, 103,680 times. And that takes a lot of energy, a lot of perfusion, and of course, a lot of support of the cardiomyocytes and the mitochondria. So of course, we know in order for a red blood cell to deliver oxygen to its target tissue, the periphery, it needs nitric oxide. 
And now there's some growing evidence that nitric oxide also, if we put a person on a cannula or rebreathing mask or hyperbaric or whatever, in order to get to the truly the peripheral area, let's say they have gangrenous tissues, actually nitric oxide is being more replete, will release it in the areas of hypoxia more strategically than just perfusing the entirety of the body. The body, of course, will have higher oxygen levels, but it's actually getting delivered to the hypoxic tissue and nitric oxide plays a role there. Supports neurotransmitters, critical for energy production, immune function, inflammatory, and regulation. But in addition from the aging process, a recap of the facts that I just have shared with you. And the NAD side of things is important. I do lecture for an NAD company and I've written extensively on NAD. And if you remember back to that one class you may have had in nutrition while going to school, before I became a naturopathic physician, I spent two years doing my basic science as an MD allopathic medical school. And my professor was from Hopkins. He was teaching the underwater basket weaving class as we would coin it. It was a class in nutrition between 88 and 1990. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But it was the same time I was having a biochemistry class, a physiology class and pharmacology, formal pharmacology with Goodman, Goodman and Gilman, Gilmore, Goodman, what well, the, the pharmacology book, I think it was Goldman and Gilmore. I can't remember now, but um, maybe I need more nitric oxide. Well, I got it right here. Um, so, but I was, we were learning about nicotinic, acid, nicotinic receptors, physiology, biochemistry. And I was asked the professor, I says, well, plagra, which is a vitamin B3 deficiency, it causes all these signs and symptoms. And isn't that known as nicotinic acid? Yes. And I says, well, couldn't you, I'm learning about this in pharmacology. I'm learning this in physiology. Couldn't we just use nutrition to push all those biochemical pathways? My liberal arts bachelor's degree in biology was kind of showing there. I graduated from Reed College. And he said, yeah, if you want to lose your license because you're going to be outside of school, that's not what you do as a medical doctor. Said, okay. And so then lo and behold, my sister was dating this guy and became a naturopathic doctor and here I am. But the reality is NAD levels are dropping. But B3, niacin, converts very inefficiently through a de novo pathway into NAD, a less efficient pathway, much like nitric oxide with the aging process. And so we're having these lower and lower levels, but the reason I brought my nutrition class is we learned in that nutrition class, your body so wants niacin, it will convert 60 milligrams of tryptophan to make one milligram of niacin, which then it has to be migrated down a milieu of biochemical pathways to make NAD. So once again, my philosophy as I share it with you, so you kind of where I'm coming from, our body makes nitric oxide, it makes ATP, it makes NAD, Anything our body makes endogenously, I love to support in my clinical practice. Because all I'm doing is keeping the body at a more useful level. So nitric oxide and sleep, um, a, a little highlight here. Finally, impairment of nitric oxide production, neurodegeneration, INOS induction has identifiable effects, including aging, neuropathologies, and onwards. So peer review literature say nitric oxide. And of course, the concept of restoration, restoring our body. Over here, peer reviewed journal article talk about how obstructive sleep apnea affects some 16% of the waking population. There's probably no secondary thing you can tell your patient other than tell them they're stressed. I find out when I tell my patients that they're stressed, they're saying, I'm not stressed. The other one that I tell them is, I think you have sleep apnea. They don't want to hear that either, but I actually get them to do home sleep studies so they don't have to go into a facility. You can actually have it ordered online these days if you don't want to run it through insurance for about $200 and get it reviewed by a sleep medicine doctor. And but what they're finding is, of course, when we have sleep apnea, and as I was describing to another colleague earlier today, if you generally come up to me and auto suffocate me all night long, I'm not going to get restful sleep. I'm not going to get my REM sleep. I'm not going to get my restorative sleep. My oxygen levels are going to be low. And then you're going to put me on a sympathetic drive. I'm going to, much like if we shot ourselves up with epinephrine, I'm going to vasoconstrict. And it's no wonder that almost 40,000 people a year die in their sleep from sleep apnea. So what they're finding is that the combined sympathetic drive of apnea, as well as the diminishment of nitric oxide production, actually is one of the morbidities and mortalities of what's happening. We also know, of course, our heart rate drops as we sleep. 
unless we're auto suffocating. And so as a result, our perfusion goes down and we're already in a hypoxic state. Literature is pretty clear that a hypoxic state is pro to many diseases and potentially also cancer. So when we look at that, we see that the review of reduced nitric oxide generation is central and peripheral sites of the sympathetic regulation and the end of the theory together explains why we also have elevated waking pressures that are observed in sleep apnea. If you recall earlier on, and I do speak quickly, that's one complaint I hear when I'm up on the stage in front of a hundred or a thousand people, but I just dump it all out there. And you know most of this anyway. When I had that 65% oxygen sleep study, where I would drop that far down at night, one of the things that led me to the sleep apnea test was two things, which are clinically interesting, in addition to my losing my hair on my legs and the peripheral artery disease. Because indeed, I was having autoxia of my lower limbs, lost all the hair, all grew back, by the way, TMI. And so as I actually didn't feel well, and my wife had me run to the store, but after going, I was a dean at the Naturopathic University at the time. So I ran to the store, I said, I just don't feel well. So a local grocery store, they had a blood pressure cuff. I was 215, 216, over 122 blood pressure. So that sympathetic drive wasn't just at night, it, of course, continued throughout the day. So as we see these patients with these odd blood pressures, can't make rhyme or reason out of them. But the secondary thing, which was interesting, is I decided I was going to get in shape. And I used to do a lot of weightlifting in school. So I decided to just grab some 20-pound dumbbells and crank out 100 reps in front of my wife's get-ready mirror right before I went to bed in my arms. The next day and for two weeks afterwards, my arm could not extend. And this was back in the day when there's briefcases you would carry to work. And for two weeks, I could not extend my arm. I created a bicep infarct. And my AST and ALT were 400, respectively, AST, ALT. Back then, there was SGPT and SGOT. And so the media got sent to a liver specialist. They couldn't find anything wrong with my liver. But lo and behold, in the peer review literature, there's Paralympic wheelchair athletes that also had elevated liver enzymes, once again, how we designate things. And it, once again, was my problem. And once my arms got over the bicep infarct, because of course I went to bed and I might as well have put a tourniquet around because I went down to 65% oxygen and those engorged muscles got to enjoy hypoxia at an extreme level. And of course, a lot of lactic acid buildup because of the hypoxia. Just a little interesting story. So this study showed that nitric oxide and obstructive sleep apnea published work suggests that a common mechanism of both the sympatho excitation and altered vascular function of the cyclic intermittent hypocapnic hypoxia was due to decreased availability of nitric oxide. So do we want with our slower heart rates at night, lower blood pressures, so 60,000 miles of blood vessels we're going through, do we not want to have great vasodilation to allow the slower heart rate and lower blood pressure to perfuse all the way down to our tippy toes and of course our brain as well? The answer is invariably yes. So once again, the nitric oxide sleep side of things, and they talked very clearly here about the different parts of our brains which are impacted and that nitric oxide containing neurons overlap the neuron groups according to sleep regulatory cycle. And so when we look here at the various aspects of our brain, whether it be the pontine pigmentum, which facilitates the rapid eye movement, nitric oxide contained within the LDT, it is on, the concept is already perfusing the body and do we have enough nitric oxide to protect the body from all these disease states that could occur or might get accelerated because we're just not breathing as well. We're in a deoxygenated state for six to eight hours, we're not getting that restorative sleep, and we start basically unraveling. And so some of the vernaculars, there was the lateral dorsal tegmentum, the pendicular um, pontine tegmentum, um, tegmentum, and the dorsal raphi nucleus. So once again, all nitric oxide, all in the literature. So why aren't we giving our patients nitric oxide, question mark? And so my disclaimer here is I am just speaking as a courtesy for the supporting group not being reimbursed. And I'm definitely not an owner of the company. So I'm just speaking like, wow, this is pretty interesting stuff. And well, what about sleep-wake cycle? Because 
other than fatigue and pain, sleep is one of the things that drives our patients to us. And they said here, reduce INOS, especially during aging, may contribute to accelerated senescence and observed senescent acceleration. And they did that in a mouse study, but they're also finding altered REM sleep, altered slow wave sleep because we don't have sufficient nitric oxide to support that because we're getting older. And so they go on to speak specifically the present report focusing on the part plate of nitric oxide regulation of sleep wake cycles updates a review of appeared um, in 2005 and they say hey nitric oxide plays a role here but what really excited me about this particular slide I created for you specifically created a slide deck just for you all was the mitochondrial NOS so when I was lecturing 10 years ago we were talking about INOS NOS and ENOS what about the mitochondrial NOS? Hmm. And knowing that I have a passion about the mitochondria, the mitochondria requires a lot of support when we go through that protein, carbs, and fats and down to the citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, for those of us that are older. And we're like, wow, am I getting all those nutrients and all that perfusion to each of those subcategories and through the electron transport chain? And more importantly, when we supplement our patients, with a given vitamin, mineral, nutrient, botanical, or food, are those targeted strategic nutraceuticals or nutrients being delivered to our desired tissue? Let's say a person has neuropathy of their lower legs and they don't have sleep apnea, but uh, we know that if we give an antifungal and I have, I have a fungus on my nails, which I don't have on my hand, and I have fungus on my feet, well, which one will it take longer course of antifungal medicine to get rid of? Well, the feet, because once again, further from the heart. So now let's say I'm giving lipoic acid or palmitol ethanolamide, which is a great little intervention for pain in the peer review literature. It's a cannabinoid-like substance and 600 milligrams a couple of times a day is what the literature shows. But if I'm not getting into my tissues, am I really getting the full therapeutic benefit? So I look at nitric oxide as a deliverer, basically clearing the way for UPS, DHL, and FedEx and USPS to get the nutrients we're giving therapeutically or the drugs to the target tissue preferentially. So according to the anatomical distribution described above, they looked at various aspects and they talked about <clears throat> the existence of nitric oxide released during sleep has been obtained in rat studies. And once again, the nucleus rathi dorsalis. So interesting, compelling sleep-wake cycles, knowing we're also doing that dance with cortisol, our stress of our lives, our melatonin, and this is now an amplifier, another straw on the camel's back that we can control. Hopefully we control that blue screen time, which is once again unique to our particular generation. Um, and so we have the heart, we have the vasodilation, we have the 100,000 times a day. We have this glorified irrigation system of 60,000 miles of blood vessels, nurturing trillions of cells, which all of course have to have energy via the mitochondria. And we have to have oxygen, otherwise our tissues will die. They'll shrivel on the vine no different than a crop would. But then we talk about <clears throat> nitric oxide and mitochondrial biogenesis. Let's say 2018, trends in molecular medicine and how we have to have sufficient nitric oxide. If we all agree, if we're all energizer bunnies and most of us as providers are, don't we need to have the energy for our brain to make the right processes, to go through the right algorithms? Likewise, our patients and hopefully the people driving behind us that know where the brake pedal is and aren't distracted by texting, then we got to have the mitochondria to support the body. And so once again, the, the concept of an MNOS, mitochondrial nitric oxide, but also ensuring that we have the mitochondrial biogenesis. Many of you, of course, supplement with CoQ10, but what about PQQ, pyroquinolone quinone, which also increases mitochondrial biogenesis, something which I use with my patients as well. But as promised, I was going to speak about diabetes and endothelial nitric oxide synthase. How many people are pre-diabetic or diabetic in the United States? A boatload, North America and Westernized worlds, particularly in the combat type two um, diabetes and so the metabolic syndrome driven. And we see increased glycation, glycation, vascular wall oxidation, but with decreased ENOS activity in inactivation nitric oxide and increased cardiovascular disease. And that's the nitric oxide aspects. Now, from my patient perspective, what I share with them is if we have non-GMO air pop popcorn, a little bit of butter and salt, 
Well, okay, that would be a normal cell, as I, as I described it to my patient. If I had a little sugar to it, that would be kettle corn. If I had more sugar to it, that's caramel corn. And if you have enough sugar, you got Cracker Jacks. So the more sugarized or glycated our cells are, and for those of you old enough to remember, we used to call it before, we called it HbA1c or A1c, we call it glycosylated hemoglobin. So our cells are being basically like glycosylated, sugarized, much like that popcorn analogy. And my patient says, oh, well, I don't want to have crunchy cells. Of course, they're not per se crunchy, but you get the idea. Then I'm going to get the perfusion, diffusion, and cellular nutrient delivery. And as you can see here, also nitric oxide levels start dropping when we get higher and higher blood sugar issues. So the product which, or the group that sponsored me, and this is the product I switched to most recently when it came out and they spoke about the fact that, well, what about, are you giving your patients oxalates? So with 9% of women with a history of kidney stone throughout their lifetime of calcium oxalate stones, 11% of gentlemen with calcium oxalate stones, do I want to be giving them a nitric oxide product which has oxalates like beets? No. So when I saw that there was an arugula product out there with the MTHF, once again, that methylene tetrahydrofolate risk for low nitric oxide levels, it became a no-brainer for me. And so with that said, a recap, nitric oxide levels are dropping. Uh, we know that as the nitric oxide levels drop and our nitric oxide synthase levels get altered, we have changes in our oxidative stress. And I'm a big test, not guess. In fact, that's one of my mantras. Ever since 1992, when I became an naturopathic physician, I test, I test, I retest, I test again. Lots, and so I want to have as much data. And there's a simple little qualitative measure of, hey, what's the nitric oxide levels? When our patients see data on a black and white or in front of them, all of a sudden they become more motivated. No matter how much they love or respect us, seeing it in black and white or seeing it in front of them, they say, oh, wow. And so I, I find it a drill that I do. In my practice, we do, of course, oximetry. We do, of course, blood pressures. We do our temperatures. And I actually will have my office manager measure nitric oxide levels on first-time patients or recurrent patients that were working on nitric oxide or just intermittently just to make sure nitric oxide levels are sufficient from a perfusion. So if I'm doing oximetry at the finger. Well, I want to know oximetry potential elsewhere. And I, if they're low, simple tests. I use as a loss leader in my practice. Everybody just gets it done. And obviously it pays for itself if they end up supplementing themselves. So the oxalate free option for nitric oxide replenishment is made by approved medical solutions. Jackie Goodling is your rep. Uh, and she's the one that will field any and all your questions. I'm available for information as well. And Jackie can hook us up and email. We can just chat as colleagues. I don't know everything. But if I know something, I will share it. And I have a lot of literature on my hard drive. <laughs> so I'm going to open up for questions. Chris, um, I'm wondering, so do you advocate using, say, a nitric oxide supplement at night for people with difficulty sleeping or in the middle of the night? If they wake up in the middle of the night, have you had much experience with that? Yeah. Um, as I've gotten older, I've been having more elusive sleep. I flirted. I flirt with melatonin use and nitric oxide. Plus, because even though I'm now on CPAP, um, I know that my heart rate drops. I major all my metrics with all the aura rings and watches and so forth. When, yeah, and I, I want great perfusion. And so the answer is yes. In fact, um, when I do blood thinners for my patients or myself, I also do that usually at night to ensure that that slower moving blood with a lower blood pressure and whatnot. I just keep nice thin blood. So, okay. So, how much of this product that you're promoting do you recommend people take at night? How many capsules? Okay. So, um, the product I'm educating on, I would say one to two capsules. It depends if you divide it throughout the day or not. We know that the half life of nitric oxide is very low. So, you want to be, in my opinion, eating good, healthy diet, other nitric oxide supportive products. But um, yeah, so one or two pills, um, HS. And then what is the product that you are representing or whatever for in increasing NAD? Do you, do, you, do you work with a company that does sublingual 
or something that's highly absorbable? Yeah, so I educated for a company that's publicly traded called True Niagen. Their ticker is called Chromadex. I also am not an owner of them. I'm a 1099. And um, they actually have a lot of human studies. I can share that information with you if you contact Jackie Goodling. And I can share with you their monographs, their peer-reviewed journal articles, including on neurodegeneration, cardiovascular disease. And there's a series of lectures available at Natural Medicine Journal. So if you go to Natural Medicine Journal, type that into Google and type in my last name, Melitis, M-E-L-E-T-I-S, you'll see I have a lecture series on NAD for sports, for GI health, and they're all if it wasn't the mention of the product, it would be all category one CME level presentations. But I do I do mention the product, so it's not, obviously. Thanks. Great questions. And I see the chat box, which yeah. I can Is open there, up um, here. If you want, I can read them to you, Dr. Melitis. That would be phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Did you say beets uh, can cause oxalates? Should it not be taken? I think you Yeah, so beets are high in oxalates. And so for people either with a known history or until they have that first kidney stone, um, we, I just avoid beets. Mm. You know, we go into beets and I do a lot of education on um, cross activities of foods and food reactions and so forth. And so um, beets are just not one of my high list things because of their potential cross reaction with a latex family and several other things. Mm. Another question about beets so that they, that should be avoided uh, to to increase nitrous oxide. Um, I, and once again, just because they have oxalates, should they be avoided? I mean, I would just once again moderation to keep eat a broad diet. Don't eat overeat foods. The average American or North American eats the same twenty five foods day in and day out. And I think you can overbeat yourself, and you don't want to beat yourself up. Uh, pun majorly intended, and not very funny. So the, the uh, super beets, they, they were advertising something with a powder of like super beets for a while. That, that would be, uh, it could, could be overdoing it. Is that? Well, I, the only concern when we do a high oxalate rich diet mm -hmm. um, and the average American runs somewhat dehydrated. Um, and I think we all remember when we were elementary schools uh, kids or we had parents supporting our scientific endeavors. Um, you basically have a super saturated solution you start dehydrating the um, sugar or salt water in your little beaker or glass at home with a little string and you start creating crystals. So I just try to avoid, you know, in preventive medicine, undue risk. And so as a result, mm -hmm. I super hydrate, try to avoid oxalate rich foods in excess. And so the big claim to fame here is this is an oxalate free product. And I saw someone mention, I do work, I do write for um, Townsend Letter. I do write for several other journals as well. And I have lots of articles. I'm more than glad to share. It's not about me. I just love writing. Okay. Um, there was a question about nitric oxide nasal spray. Yeah. Okay. So once again, do not work for this company. Um, it's, uh, I can't know, can't see if you see it. It's all in Hebrew. But the product in English is called Enovid, E N O V I D. And Enovid is a product which, according to them, and I don't work for them, I'm not making a claim, I repeat it, 99.9% effectiveness in killing viruses. It happened to have came out in the last couple, two, three years, was not allowed in the United States, still not allowed in the United States. You can order it online through an Israeli pharmacy, which I do, and just came in, I flew from seeing my sister with breast cancer, and the husband or wife or partners or whatever they were behind me were hacking uh, with no masks. And oh. um, I could feel the mist on the top of my very bald head, benefits of a bald head. And um, <laughs> and so the, the moment I got out of the, off the airplane, um, out came the product. I'm saying I'm yeah, death to whatever virus I just inhaled. Mm -hmm. Um, can nitric nitric oxide worsen active cancer, which might promote angiogenesis? And I think the answer on that is jury's still out. Just like the NAD conversation, there was an article coming out on NAD, the same thing. I think we have to be judicious. And if we have angiogenesis occurring and we're vasodilating, is there a problem? 
We don't want to feed, I personify over the decades of clinical practice, cancers as pigs. They usually have a very high metabolism. They want a lot of blood supply. They want a lot of energy. They want a lot of sugar. And it could be one of the downsides of giving a person that has an active disease process more fuel problematic. So clear, like for my sister, she's not on nitric oxide, even though there's literature out there showing that nitric oxide may, under the right circumstance, the may is not big enough for me to give it to my sister. Should nitric oxide be taken before sleep or, or, or some use it before exercise? It's a statement, is that? Yeah, and so before exercise, um, in, invariably great. Um, reminds me of a story, which I have lots of over the last 30 years, of a gentleman that decided for his 50th birthday, he was going to do a marathon. He worked for a local bakery called Oro Wheat Bakery, large bakery. And he says, I says, well, I don't think we have any marathons in Oregon. He says, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do a marathon in Oregon. I'm going to go to Colorado. Big problem, as you all know, between Oregon and Colorado, we're a sea-loving state, we're sea level. He decided he was going to run a marathon up in Colorado. And I said, so you want to see your 51st birthday? So we bumped up his mitochondria. We did an organic acid test for him to make sure his mitochondria are up to snuff him and give him nitric oxide and some prayers. And lo and behold, it wasn't a regular marathon. He decided for his 51st or 50th birthday, he's going to do an ultra marathon. He survived it. He's still kicking. Um, and so with luck, fortitude, and who knows, so made some good genes, he actually survived his first marathon, which he decided was going to be an ultra marathon at altitude. And nitric oxide was one of the things we gave him. Okay. Now, or nitric this, oxide is a, support. this is a question in the chat. How do you compare this nitric oxide process, product with others in the market? So thank you. Um, I'd like to take that question instead of Chris. <laughs> I'm Maria Watson. I'm the founder of Approved Medical Solutions. And I've been in the supplement business a little over 32 years. And I was part of the team that actually created Super Beats. And I've been in the nitric oxide space for about 12 years. And Chris, how long have you and I worked together? Um, since 2005. Yeah, it's been a long, long journey. First of all, I want to say thank you for presenting on this topic. I know that the journey into nitric oxide, we, we did it together. And this particular formulation was born out of a repeated exposure to random people that were afraid of oxalates. Mm. So when I got back into the nitric oxide space with my own product, it isn't really about comparing it. If as long as they're non-arginine based, Every product in the marketplace is attempting to get your body to replenish your nitric oxide. Mm. They're just all going about it with different mechanisms. I do want to let you know that when I, what I recommend when I'm training some of my doctors and my pharmacists on my formula, I recommend that you see for yourself how long this lasts, because I've got people that test again at 10 hours, at 12 hours, the next morning. So I think individuals will all have different needs, but right now, if you believe in nitric oxide replenishment around the clock, then it's two capsules in the morning and it's two capsules at bed, but you just keep testing because at some point you can titrate down. So hopefully that's helpful. And Maria Watson um, and I started working together when she was the owner with her husband of complementary prescriptions, vitamin research products, where I was the editor of the newsletter and lecturer. <clears throat> Can you take too much nitric oxide? Um, I think the answer is always stay physiological. That's where we like to test with the test strips. Mm -hmm. And as Maria commented upon, get to a physiological level. If we're going after a sign or a symptom, even though we're not, of course, on medication, but we're going clinically after, well, I want to have my feet aren't cold, or I have Renault syndrome, or I have, I have, then we go ahead and, you know, target that. But I, for me, it's two pills a day um, on a good day, on a bad day, like traveling, it's four pills a day, like Maria said. Um, if I'm feeling particularly um, lactic acid buildup, um, 
and whatnot, I, I crank it up. Um, but can you go super physiological as with any drug, any hormone? The goal is to stay in the physiological range. And that's why testing with the little test strips are helpful. And then of course, my measuring signs, symptoms and clinical correlation. Are you yet adding potassium nitrate in your formula? Yes, the nitrate source is coming from the potassium nitrate contribution, and we chose arugula. Uh, it's the it's the you know non-detectable oxalate, but it is the highest uh, contribution to dietary nitrates. We yeah, also here's my concern about the tongue testing. I mean, it does not really reflect um, the physiological function of the nitric oxide. It's better if you use endothelial function test to monetize oh, yeah. the efficacy and that's, of your... That, I believe that everybody on this call is a whole lot smarter than me when it comes to how you want to deal with your patients. All I know from a marketing standpoint, which was my role way back in complementary prescriptions, like Chris said, whatever system you use to test, a patient is so much more compliant when later you can retest them and show that your recommendation moved the needle. So what I have found is that the simplicity of that test, if you believe in it, you may believe in another way to test. It's just so good in today's Google, Dr. Google knows everything. So the way to keep them not at Amazon and not at Dr. Google is to utilize a test, make a recommendation, and then prove that it's working. And I would agree with the um, comment that was made. Well, your, your comment, Maria, of course, um, because it's exactly how I look at things is data is data, but the more, whether it be a pulse wave, pulse velocity, endothelial measurement, the more fancy we can get, the more precise precision medicine all day long. I mean, one's qualitative, one is, you know, truly measuring what's happening. So I, I agree with you, Doc. Are your formulation contain theols, like um, sulfur hydrogens? I mean, uh, like NAC, alpha lipoic acid, theols. No, this no. formulation is actually very simple, very precise, but very much staying out of the crosshairs of all the lawsuits flying around in the nitric oxide space. Again, I've been in this space for a very long time. So there's the, the, the it is just preposterous so often when I see, again, at complementary prescriptions, we had about 400 SKUs. And I think we were the very first people to ever do the drop ship, the inventory free model. I think Chris and I invented that. So it's just a journey that has brought me to let me just get a safe method for people that are afraid of oxalates. We're going to get them replenished in nitric oxide because their lifestyle is, is what could be killing their nitric oxide, brushing their teeth. So I think we're just trying to stay focused on if as a physician, you believe it is important to keep them replenished, I promise you this product will perform. And, and the formula is on the page. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Does Viagra Cialis medications help nitric oxide in a, in a healthy way? Of course, it's a roundabout way. And the way I look at those medications, and I do prescribe them for people that need them to function at a multitude of levels um, is it's the end result of when nothing else works. Generally, when I support nitric oxide levels at a foundational level, it's actually working at truly a foundational level opposed to a roundabout way. So could it be used in concert? We all know when we see those commercials, um, if you're taking a nitrate product, blah, 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 don't add or have an additive effect. I take it from this approach you could take Cialis every day of your life, um, which is part of the prescribing protocols if you're not just doing the weekend regime, um, but it's still not addressing making nitric oxide the way it could be 
of making more of it opposed to just trying to mitigate the breakdown of it. So um, also on a side note, since we mentioned Cialis, um, one of the first times I, when Cialis first came out, it was actually being used with um, some of my surgeons that I work with because they will do it before and after prostate cancer surgery to help prevent ED secondary. And they actually have some pretty good outcomes on that. But I actually use nitric oxide support nutritional supplements over prescriptions preferentially because I think it's actually teaching a person to fish if it wasn't giving them fish. Okay. Okay. And there's a little background thing there. Which test strip brand do you recommend? I will let Maria speak to that um, as um, it's Maria's company, but Maria has sourced a, a, a test strip if she's still available. Yes, I'm right here. And but I do want you to know that I get an absolute kick out of the idea that you can use any test strip you want. You can use mine, you can use any of the company's test strips. They all get the measurement the same way out of the nitrite in the saliva. But I I find it amusing that you could use somebody else's test strip and test my formula and see how reliable mine is. And then I really encourage you to do that six hour, eight hour, 10 hour, 12 hour, and then even the next morning. And I see a question here yeah. on the nitric oxide requirements, same for homozygous versus heterozygous MTHFR. Um, well, if you're a heterozygous, and I'm assuming the person asked this question probably already knows the answer. It depends on heterozygous for the 1298 or the 7T. If you're heterozygous for 6A, 7T, it's a little different effect than if you're heterozygous for the 1298A. Um, so the answer is supporting um, methylene tetrahydrofolate, in my opinion, in today's world with anti folate metabolites and antifolate drugs out there. I, I think it's just a no-brainer to have a small amount of methylene tetrahydrofolate in one's diet, and if nothing else, from a methylation perspective. And so, um, but yeah, the more homozygotes you are, assuming the diet and lifestyle are the same and the drug regimes are the same, then I would say that the more homozygous you are, the more you're going to need the MTHF. At least that's my answer. Someone can disagree with me. I'm fine with that. Is it harmful to take plain citrulline or arginine to stimulate nitric oxide? Um, it's not harmful. Arginine goes through multiple, multiple enzymatic dependent steps. And so just like we were talking about MTHF and the defect of the methylene tetrahydrofolate or polymorphism, we don't want to use the word defect. Um, likewise, to assume that we can actually get arginine efficiently down, especially with the aging process, down to um, nitric oxide is a hope and a wish with rare exception of genetics. Um, citrulline is maybe a slightly better, but once again, not the way I do it and not the way I would count on doing it. Bodybuilders and people that like to bump up their citrulline for general perfusion, they can do it. But once again, it's not how I would support nitric oxide from a carte blanche perspective. I like to take it more from a strategic perspective. Okay. Um, okay. Um, using red light laser phototherapy releases releases nitric oxide. Is there any information on if they achieve therapeutic levels? And actually, um, I've lectured on neuropathy quite a bit and and pain. And actually, using the laser and red light as with the nitric oxide product, they actually seem to have a very nice synergistic effect. Um, as to speak about the nuances, I'll talk about a, a protocol offline with that provider and not knowing if it's a provider or not. Okay, actually she's our, our holistic uh, uh, veterinarian. There we go. <laughs> Some of the brightest people I know are veterinarians. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know how you keep track of all those species, but God bless you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Siegel gave us a talk about a couple of weeks ago. It's on our website, uh, if you're at all interested, and it was really quite fascinating. Um, 
she actually gets to do a lot of the things we'd like to do, but uh, since she's dealing with animals, she gets to do them uh, and we, you know, and not apologize for them. So I'd like to tell you that with all the trade shows I've gone to and lectures, the, the cell, one of the stem cell uh, events, they must have had 10 different red light therapy people in that exhibit hall. And as I walked around to those booths, it was fascinating to me that at the end of the day, whether it's the $10,000 version or the $2,000 hat, the whole story led back to that it was going to stimulate nitric oxide and stimulate improved blood flow. So I don't know. I kind of just walked around thinking, okay, well, let's see, two pills for $20,000 worth of red lights. So I know they work, but I, they all say that the reason they work is because of the nitric oxide production. And, and to speak to Dr. Siegel, um, whenever we said Bob Barker, Bob Barker, our animals spay and neuter them, we always opt for the, um, the um, laser. And I think localized, yeah, there's increased nitric oxide. I just don't believe it's systemic sufficiently if you're just using it locally. So that'll be my answer. Okay. Um, that's all the questions that are in the chat. Uh, oh, wait, there's two, wait, two more. Okay, a couple of thank yous. So, uh, what are the mainstays of your approach to per, uh, peripheral neuropathy? Um, lipoic acid. And um, once again, feel free, um, Doc, to communicate directly with me. I'll give you my specific, very successful protocol, including for cranial neuropathy. Um, which my brother-in-law had and had diplopia, had phenomenal results. But it includes lipoic acid, palmitol ethanolamide, which is, you can just PubMed it, pretty compelling. And clearly, of course, making sure the B vitamins are sufficient. They're diabetic, obviously, we need to address that. And then supporting the mitochondria. But lipoic acid, palmitol ethanolamide, the B vitamins, and a few other little magic sauces, which I would feel more comfortable sharing off the record. Okay. Doctor, would you um, give this uh, to a pregnant lady who experienced uh, bad insomnia, uh, that she's not able to sleep, and uh -huh. she's about 20 weeks pregnant? And the answer is, I never treat pregnant ladies. The liability is too great. Um, and so the answer is, don't know the risk. I don't believe the risk is that high. However, pregnancy, as we know, just like pediatrics, there's a special category for them. And I would probably try other things before I would introduce any one supplement like this. I would try more simple approaches. And that would be applying to any supplement. If you ask me about vitamin C or B12 or anything, pregnancy, I, we treat you know, much like we do oncology with a um, hands-off approach. I wish I could answer that question. I cannot. Thank you. And that there's an example right there where Dr. Siegel's got it all over us there, the veterinary world. So, <laughs> so. And I want okay. to jump and just say thank you for having us. No, um, thank you. Of course, we're always happy to be with your group. And any questions, reach out to me. My cell phone number is on the chat box. But we encourage the practitioners to, to go directly to our website, which is approvedmedicalsolutions.com and register. We have a really great special for practitioners. If you are not a licensed practitioner, we do have a discount for you as well that goes directly through Dr. Clearfield. So we can uh, connect and you can get my phone number and you also have a discount code that I put in the chat box as well. So I look forward to hearing from you guys. And thank you for your time, everyone. And um, yep. Keep on doing what you're yes, doing. Thank you. Together, yeah. we're going to move the needle, and it's just an honor that you spent time with me. So, thank you. Yes. Hey, thank, you Dr. thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Miletus. Thank you, Dr. Musnick, for being here. Thank you. We, we're here every Tuesday night at five o'clock. You're more than welcome to to join us. And um, Jackie, um, uh, like I said, has a they have a, a special for our practice our our group here. If you're interested in, um, you know, uh, exploring further, um, here's the phone number right here, um, and um, that's that's it. Um, so, um, 
Anybody else, any other questions, comments? And Jackie can also connect anybody specific, directly with me and she'll give my personal email and I'll be more than glad to communicate with one and all of you. So thank you for all being what, who you are and what you're doing and together we'll be the, move the needle together. Okay. Okay, next week we have Dr. Jenny Blanchard Stone, one of our own, she's gonna be speaking on pandas uh, and acute immune encephalitis, that's something that I don't see a whole lot of, but uh, we'll, we'll be interested in, in hearing what she has to say. Also next week, I, I know Dr. Halasa is, uh, has a, is at a conference in Houston. I'm gonna be at AMMG, Age Management Medical Group in Miami. Um, I'm giving three lectures. Um, if you're in the area, stop stop by. Um, I don't know if you, you're gonna be at the vendor uh, place there, Maria or, or Dr. Miletus, um, but uh, we'll be at the, the Round National uh, uh, Golf Club and um, uh, we're, it's usually a pretty good time. So if you're looking for CME credits, um, uh, it's a it's a not, it's a great group and uh, it's pretty relaxed um, and we have we have a, a lot of interesting um, uh, back and forth. Um, anybody who's interested in in presenting, please let me know. Um, uh, like I said, next week, Dr. Jenny Stone. After, the week after that, we have Dr. David Weiss, and then again, our own Kent Crowley will be will be speaking. So that's coming up. Um, any comments, questions, complaints? Thank you, Dr. Molitas, for your time and your expertise. Thank you, Maria, also, and Jackie, um, you know, for being being a good friend to us. Um, um, and that's about it. We'll have this up on our website as soon as uh, as soon as I can. Usually within 24 to 48 hours. Um, all of our uh, previous uh, work is at AOSRD.org slash webinars right there you can get it and um and if you have any topics or or, or uh, that you want to hear about um and that um, you're not an expert in let me know and we'll we'll hunt them down and uh, anybody who you know we're the uh, you know in, integrative uh, medical world is our is our oyster so okay everybody so any comments questions again thank you thank you all um, thank you all for being here with us again, and um, I'll see you uh, next week. Same time, same station. Good night. Thank you.